How do you follow that? I'll just have to do my best. In July 1911, Nature published an interesting letter. The sender was Antonius van den Broek, an amateur, amateur physicist to those were the days. Van den Broek proposed that the fundamental feature distinguishing one element from another was the number of positive charges in its nuclei. Mosley read the letter. Not only did he think that van den Broek was right, he began looking for ways to confirm it. After talking with the dad from the dad and son brag team, he began thinking the answer might lie in probing elements with x-rays. By the end of 1912, the world had learned about the younger Bragg's famous equation. Mosley now knew everything he needed to discover whether elements are defined by their number of positive charges. To put knowledge of the atom in 1913 in context, we need to bear in mind that nothing was agreed. Rutherford had published his model of the atom only two years earlier. It had made no great impact. Bohr had only just come up with his idea of electron shells. Alfred Werner thought an undiscovered element lay between hydrogen and helium. And not to be outdone, Johannes Rydberg said that two elements lay between hydrogen and helium. Three years before his death, Dmitry Mendeleev said he believed two elements lighter than hydrogen would be discovered. Werner, Rydberg and Mendeleev's arguments were theoretical, but backed by unexplained lines in the spectra of stars. Here's Werner's periodic table from 1905. He wrote it full width, but I'll show it in short form. Mendeleev told the world that the periodic table was built by adding to the atomic weight of the preceding element. But more accurate measurements revealed major problems with this. Scientists agonized over the highlighted pairings, where the higher atomic weight element comes first. Argon potassium, cobalt nickel, tellurium iodine, praseodymium neodymium. The chemical properties of these elements had given them a different place in the periodic table from the one demanded by their atomic weights. Look at how Werner left spaces for elements he thought would be discovered. Three lighter than hydrogen and one between hydrogen and helium. There were plenty of problems, and Mosley was about to solve them. Here's what he did. He boiled electrons from a metal filament. It's happening here in an incandescent light bulb. The metal is so hot that it's shedding electrons, making a cloud of them within the bulb. In a light bulb, that's the end of the story. But Mosley used a cathode ray tube to accelerate electrons from a hot cathode to very high speeds. The electrons crashed into whichever chemical element was in the firing line. This generated a lot of heat, so much that Mosley had problems with the elements of vaporizing and cracking. Some particularly high-energy electron impacts generated X-rays. Only about 1% of incoming electrons lose enough of their kinetic energy in a single event to generate an X-ray photon. Most lose their energy a bit at a time in lower-energy interactions. Electron arrivals generated X-rays in two ways. One produced a continuous spectrum which Mosley wasn't interested in. What really interested him was that when the potential difference between cathode and anode is high enough, the cathode ray electrons pick up enough kinetic energy to eject tightly bound inner shell electrons from atoms. An electron from an outer shell immediately fills the vacancy, giving up energy in the form of X-ray emission. Mosley's work showed that these X-rays are unique to the element radiating them, because every element has one-of-a-kind electron energy levels. These X-rays are called characteristic X-rays. Mosley contained the X-rays using lead shielding, allowing one narrow beam to emerge. He measured the reflection angle theta from a crystal angle to reflect X-rays at the greatest intensity. The Bragg equation gave him the wavelength of the X-rays because he had already determined D, the space in between layers of atoms in the crystal, and the crystal was already known to reflect strongly in its first three orders, with the third most prominent, so n equals 3. From the wavelengths, he got frequencies by rearranging v equals f lambda, and knowing that x-rays travel at the speed of light. He gathered frequency data for elements 13 to 79, and plotted the element's position in the periodic table against the square root of frequency. He found he had two groups of perfect straight lines. These came from K X-rays made when outer shell electrons fall to the first electron shell.
and from L X-rays made when outer shell electrons fall to the second electron shell. Moseline might have found that the square root of frequency was perfectly proportional to the atomic weight in line with generally agreed theory. He didn't. He found it was proportional to a different number, identical to the position of an element in the periodic table. The Rutherford Bohr atomic model required that the energies of deeply bound electrons and hence X-ray frequencies be proportional to Z squared, the charge on the nucleus squared. Therefore, adding one unit of nuclear charge to an element's atoms led to the next element in the periodic table. Moseley had untangled the problem of atomic weights versus chemical properties. His graph showed vacancies for elements 43, 61 and 75. These were elements yet to be discovered, which were later discovered. In unpublished work, Mosley spotted an error in rare earth classifications, revealing a further gap at element 72. In May 1914, Georges Urbain called on Mosley with samples of rare earth minerals. Urbain had discovered the rare earth element lutetium and was an expert on rare earths. John Heilbronn described the visit in this way. Mosley had answered three questions vital for the future of science. His results were in accord with the Rutherford Bohr atom, with a tiny positive nucleus orbited by electrons in defined, quantized energy shells. He proved that an element was defined by the number of positive charges in the nuclei of its atoms. Hydrogen had just one positive charge and therefore there were no elements lighter than hydrogen.